So I guess you're running that already? All right. So um, let's see. There are some, a variety of odds and ends that I want to talk about today. Um, one goes back to, um, well, let's go, let's go all the way back to homework six. There was something interesting in homework six um, that uh, I thought I'd just mention. Namely, we were considering um, We were considering two diagrams that look like this, and we were considering the uh, SU2 uh, gate theory where sigma A was sigma A over 2. And um, so we were looking at this PA, QB, now I call it Q, right, PA, QB, P1 prime, C, Q. Now that's a comma. P prime, C and uh, Q prime D, and then there was another diagram that looked like this, which of course was just P A, Q B, Q prime D, Q prime C. Anyway, when we computed the amplitude, I'm just looking at my solution, I assume you guys had the same thing. We had uh, the I M was I E squared over four, and there was uh, one term u bar p prime s prime. Um, if they don't they don't have a Monday Wednesday slot for this time. At least for what I'm looking at. Really? Go <laughs> ahead. I just I was just looking at it. Back. It's, it's That's the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, 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 I was on the I epsilon don't matter. Um, okay, so this was the the amplitude, and what I what I wanted to call your attention to was um, basically the the symmetry of the thing. Namely, if we were looking at the process where one where the two fermions coming in are both in the one state, so these a A's were um, ones. Wait a minute, that was a mistake there. This is B. December 15th. It's Wednesday from 5.30 to 7.30 on finals week. Wednesday, 5.30 to 7.30. So that's yeah. next, next. That's Wednesday. a week from Wednesday. Yes. 5.30 to 7.30. Well, let's write that down. So actually, 5.30 to 7.30 Wednesday. Okay, so we'll have the last lecture of the course will be then. And we won't have a lecture on Monday. Okay. But we'll have a lecture a day after tomorrow. Can we do the lecture on Monday? Mm -hmm. Can we do the lecture on Monday? Can we what? Do the lecture on Monday instead of Wednesday? Or is it well, I'm Monday? easy with that, but the question is, is the, will the, will the class be available? So or there are... Will be available? There are Monday 5.30 to 7.30 uh, time slots. 
or classes that are Monday 4 to 5.15 or 5 to 6.15. So I don't know if there's a class here from 4 you to 5.15. You know, 15. what I just erased here was what uh, Prasad had written for his homework, his final exam schedule. Um, well, I erased it. I'm almost positive. Uh, oh, it's on Wednesday, okay. 10 to 12. Huh? It's on Wednesday, 10 to 12. The 466 mm -hmm. exam is Wednesday, yeah. 10 to 12. Mm -hmm. So what was the one that would be conflicting? Classes that are Monday, Wednesday, 4 to 5.15 have a final Monday from 5.30 to 7.30. 4 to 5.15. So is there a class here from 4 to 5? Yes, there is. That is the course by uh, Rudolph. Wolfgang Rudolph is teaching. Uh, uh, so I will ask him. If his course is um, holding class, then... Uh, I mean, couldn't we could just do it in the one of the meeting rooms if we wanted to? There's, that thing certainly gets Those open. meeting rooms are not as available as one would think. At, um, at 5.30? <laughs> All right, I tell you what. We've got time. I will find out. In fact, let's, let's have this. Uh, you're interested in this. Who, who's really interested in this? Those who are really interested. Well, let's. Uh, all right. Let, let's, you mean in having let's a traditional not, lecture? Yeah. I don't know. No, what sure. I want is. Of two of you guys uh, to remember to ask, say, Sandra or Lena or Daniel, or ask the work study if you want. Um, find out, find out uh, if find out what room would be available five thirty Monday. Okay, and. Uh, we can we can presumably do it in room 1131. The trouble is, it's you know instead of having lots of good blackboards, they have one bad blackboard. But uh, but I guess you guys would like to have it finish on Monday rather than Wednesday. I thought there might be somebody that had an exam conflict on Monday, and so all right. Okay. Well, notice. Um, Suppose we were looking at the case where 1-1 one, one goes to 2-2. <coughs> two, two. So the outgoing fermions are both in the, in the so to speak, spin down state and the uh, incoming, I'm sorry, the, yeah, spin down, the incoming ones say are in the spin up. But this is isospin. This is the, the thing that describes these lower indices on the sigma. Well then, what you have to do here is sum over i, sigma i, c a, sigma i, d b. And for this case where 1, 1 goes to 2, 2, that would be sigma i, 2, 1, sigma i, 2, 1. And remember what the sigmas are, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, minus i, i, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So we're talking about the 2, 1 spot. So what we get is 1 squared plus i squared plus 0 squared, and that's 0. So the amplitude is 0. Also, clearly, if you were doing 2, 2 to 1, 1, then you would have gotten 1 squared plus minus i squared plus 0. So that's an example of how the, um, the, the, uh, so the two, the two components in the field for this were like originally the proton and the neutrons, or they were, that was what it was when people originally started to think about SU2, it was proton-neutron. They had masses of um, the order of 940 MeV, and
and they differ by less than 2 MeV. And so that's, uh, that's why that was proposed as a uh, symmetry was called an isosphere. And um, what was also found was that the interactions of neutrons and protons, the strong interactions of neutrons and protons were pretty much the same. And uh, of course, there was also the, the electromagnetic interaction was different. But the electromagnetic interaction of neutron with proton wasn't a big deal because one of them is neutral. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. But it, a question occurred to me, which I haven't resolved because it only occurred to me this afternoon. What? Um, what about, suppose we were doing the following, suppose, well, that's, that's SU3, but suppose more generally we're considering TA, 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 and um, we're doing a similar sum. By the way, the one down here just has C and D interchanged, so if it was, uh, if it was uh, 1, 1 goes to 2, 2, you get the same answer. And so, in other words, what about something like this um, for a general gauge theory? Is this always zero? And I don't know. Um, so just a... Why would you expect it to be zero in general? Well... Wouldn't it be the analog of um, in other words, it would represent the process one one goes to two two. But in this more general gauge theory. Of course the you could have more possibilities. You could have one one goes to three three or four four. Um, um, I suppose we could look at that immediately for the case of the the, the Gelman matrices look like the first three are just sigma matrices. Um, let's see, I don't have them written down anywhere immediately. Um, Let's just see what I could find on here. Hold on. It's so hard to find things in this book by um, Eskin and Schroeder. This Yeah, they're on 502? No, no. This is oh, you've got them in Weinberg. Okay. So let's just, uh, let's work them out then. Let's, let's just relapse, uh, do it. So we're looking at 2-1. Um, so we get 1 squared for the first one, plus I squared for the second one, plus 0 squared. So that's just like with SU2. Then we get two zeros, two more zero squares. Oh boy, two more zero squares. Wow. So, zero. So that's interesting. Um, so it works out, and presumably, if we did, uh, if we did, for example, one three. It's also zero. All right, let me do one, one three. So that would be the 3 1. 3 1. So that's 0, 0, 0, 1, 
squared plus i squared, zero, zero, zero. Zero again. Okay. What I don't see is what, what's the general rule that tells us that TA, say BC, well, not BC, say IJ, TA, IJ, is zero if I not equal J summed over A for any Lie group? Um, I don't know. It's just, does, does anybody recognize that? All right, that was just a just a thought. It seems to work. Huh? But the representation should be orthogonal. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the characters, though. It's right, it's a character thing. It's, it's a character thing, not the. It's a trace of some. No, no, no. But he's right. He's right. Also, I think. Yeah. Um. All right, well, it's, it's, it's there somewhere. Um, if somebody can find a, a precise statement, do let me know. Okay, something else from the homework that I thought I'd mention, unless all of you have already looked at the homework for seven and the coherent statement for representation and so forth. What about it? Huh? What about it? Did you look at the solutions? Uh, no. All right. All right, but let me let me show you a um, the the way in which I uh, assumed you do the problem was the uh, in, in which I, I said to the grade to give full credit for the problem was to um, do fourteen more or less as you did thirteen. However. Um, there's a nicer way of doing things, and I thought I'd mention that to you. It's worth um, worth looking at. So let's um, we were defining it in the following way. We were saying chi was an integral of psi dagger chi minus a half chi dagger chi d cubed x on a state. The zero and the zero state was one that was annihilated by um, by the field operator. Okay, and that's the way we took it. And what I wanted to, uh, to show you today is that we can define something which um, can be called, a, it's the analog of the displacement operator that Glauber introduced for um, uh, bosons. Okay, so let's let's think of that as an integral. Chi is a Grassmann field, and uh, psi and psi and psi dagger are the normal fermion fields. The point is then that this is a unitary operator. Okay. The adjoint chi is the inverse. Both and now there's an identity which it's a restricted identity. It uh, works when the commutator of A and B commutes with A, and the commutator of A and B commutes with B. I thought for the Fermi fields, the displacement, this looks like the bosonic displacement operator. It, yes, and it, it looks exactly like it, yes. I thought for the fermions it had the, like a chi star chi. At least that's what I used in the problem. You mean like here? Yeah. Well, that's in this form. We'll get there in a moment. So this uh, commute, this holds whenever A and B commute with the commutator. And um, so in this particular case, what we can say is that E to the integral 
psi dagger pi d cubed x e to the minus integral pi dagger psi d cubed x. So this is this is a normally ordered form of the displacement operator. What's up? This is the fermionic displacement operator, right? Yes. For fermionic Yes. Here, let me throw a couple of these down. You can share them. I've lost the track. Down. Some people may have asked that. Actually, Actually it, was, it was also a... Uh, you didn't ask a question, Dave. I also owe oh, you guys in the back one. Um, is there anybody else who... All right, you get one. Huh? Shouldn't there be some phase or something? <laughs> what? Shouldn't there be a phase as well or something? You're breaking up D into that, right? Right, but I, have, I don't need this on yet. Well, minus a half the commutator of psi dagger pi. So the normally ordered form of this displacement operator is this, by this, um, uh, this identity here. And we can say, well, that is just the displacement operator itself, and then an integral of this commutator, e to the minus a half integral and then it's the commutator of psi dagger pi the group pi dagger psi, and we have this is actually d cubed x, not y. And um, do you want me to do this in detail, or shall I just give you the bottom line of what this is? I think maybe the bottom line is good enough. This is then d of chi e to the one half chi dagger chi d cube x. Okay. So that tells us then that the displacement operator itself is the normally ordered displacement operator times e to the minus a half integral chi dagger chi. All right, so now if we have d of chi on zero, what we get is, uh, of course, this, this is quadratic in anti commuting field, so it commutes with everything. So we can just write that as e to minus a half integral pi back of chi into x. And then what's left? is the normally ordered chi on the vacuum, or the, I, I say the vacuum, I mean this state here. And I'm you know, better off without the glasses. And um, so what we get is this, this is the normally ordered form. When this hits the vacuum, you just get one, because psi annihilates the vacuum. And so you just have this left over and so this is equal to uh, what we expect, namely integral psi dagger pi minus a half psi dagger pi to keep that this. So this is the state pi that we originally were talking about. All right, now, you won't be surprised, um, let's see, let me, let me define the following thing. D of chi, I unfortunately had a terrible notation in the, when I wrote this up, but, um, I had x, lambda, and chi, and all three look almost the same. Um, so I'm going to try to remedy that a little bit. I'm going to change lambda to um, uh, 
one. <laughs> one. <laughs> Okay, this is e to the y integral psi dagger chi minus chi dagger psi dq x. Of course, we're going to have a dq y coming up, and so this is a really bad choice. Let's make it u. Okay, and now we can define um, psi of x and u as d dagger of chi and u psi of x, d of pi and u. All right. Now, let's compute d psi of x and u, d u. Well, this is just going to bring down this argument of the exponential with a minus sign on the left from d adjoint and with a plus sign on the right. And so this is going to be the dagger of chi and u, the commutator of the integral of chi dagger psi minus psi dagger chi d cube x. Well, I have d cube y actually. Psi of x, d of chi. Do you want to see all the steps here, or shall I just bounce through it quickly? Huh? Quickly is fine. Okay, this is the d dagger of chi and u, and this is just chi of x, d of chi. But, of course, chi is an anti-commuting object, but d is quadratic in fermionic fields, so chi commutes with d. And so this is chi of x, d dagger d, but d is unitary, so this is just chi of x. So we can compute then psi of x and u, it's just psi of x and 0, plus an integral from 0 to 1 of um, Sorry, I need a 1. Let's compute this. This is an integral 0 to 1 of chi of x du say, which is just psi of x and 0 plus chi of x. But, and so, using this definition, what we get is that d dagger of pi psi of x d of pi is psi of x plus pi of x.
this relation here. Okay. Now, a couple of remarks to generalize this. Um, one is that this also works for bosons. And all and but the second remark is that um, what we call zero, um, we have some flexibility. You see this this displacement hot operator structure is very general, but we can change what we meant by the zero state. In other words, we were saying that the field, all components of the field, annihilate this. Okay. But that meant that we're basically dealing with a kind of Dirac C. It's, it's a state where all the antiparticle states are filled and all the particle states are empty. So the creation operator and the annihilation operator are both knock this out. What we could do is something that's uh, closer to that paper that I put online by Glauber. Wait, what did you just say? Did you say the creation operator also? Right. In other words, what is this structure here? It's an integral dqp over 2 pi q root 2 et and then um, a of p and s u of p and s e plus or minus Px plus B dagger of P and S, B of P and S, E to the, and again, plus or minus in front of the eyes. Does anybody remember which it is in this kind of two? I've got it written uh, down on that, but. This is the right one. Okay, for pest. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, we want this to annihilate that. So that means that all these states are filled and all these states are empty. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, though, that's um, a little more physical, is to say that we're not going to have the psi annihilate the vacuum. We're just going to have the positive frequency part annihilate the vacuum. That means that only these guys and I like to know. So then, all this razzmatazz that we've done, it works for psi, but it also works for the positive and negative frequency part separately. In other words, what we get is d dagger of pi, psi plus, mx d of pi is psi plus m of x plus chi m plus of x. And let me just say time right that way. Okay? Sorry? Do I own the candy? But so if if you I don't need a candy, it's good. If if you say plus, so now it's the vacuum, then our original proof no longer holds, right? Because you had to use the fact that the total wave function. I did in in one spot, but notice what we what we what we'll have here. What we'll have now is we'll still have. All right, let, 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 let me show. Great question. Yeah, hi, I'm teaching. Uh, let me call you back when I finish. Um, I don't know why Obama has to call doing that. What? It must be pretty important. <laughs> All right, anyway. So, V dagger of pi. So, the plus n of x. D of pi then. On the back end of pi. Is psi m plus of x plus chi m plus of x. So I don't recall what the, the positive frequency part of chi is. 
we can write chi as the same sort of That's right. foyer. Right. Uh, there's no operators in that, right? Right. Okay. But you do the equivalent thing. And in fact, well, what I wanted to say was, let, let, let me get through to this. We have this. And um, so in particular, psi m plus of x on d of chi. And now I'm going to have, so I, I don't know what to call these. Um, does anybody have a good idea as to what, how to distinguish notationally the two back to us? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> well, or <laughs> two. This is the this is sort of the real one. <laughs> Donut. Why is that even real? Well, it's the, it's the one that's naively. It's the back. It's the ground state of the free Hamiltonian. And how does what? this notation remind me of that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's fine. Well, we'll just use it, though. All right, I'll put it back. <laughs> okay, so Plus this on that, what, what is this? <laughs> this is D dagger of chi. Oh, no, this is D of chi. So this is um, what did I want to say? You know, the equation I had was over here. It was that this pulled through. Psi d. Yeah, this there isn't an extra one. Is, it's, it's this plus chi m plus. Okay, this was the... In other words, we have that, and consequently, multiplying from the left by d, we get this. Right, and this acting on, the back, on, on this zero plus state. This annihilates that state, and so we have b of chi, uh, chi plus m of x, zero plus, and so this is chi plus m of x, d of chi, and now we can say that psi plus m of x on this other chi, which I can call chi plus if you want, is chi plus m of x chi plus. Okay. But these are fermionic coherent states that are um, more physical. They're, they're essentially related to the bare vacuum, whereas this, these ones are related to the Dirac C, which is clearly unphysical. Um, and then we get the, the taking the adjoint, we get this, uh, chi plus, the adjoint of chi plus is chi minus, or at least, um, or let us say for chi, yes. chi well, the thing is that, that Chi plus adjoint isn't the same thing as that, so I, I guess I should call this chi plus star is chi plus adjoint, which isn't quite the same thing because it's not Hermitian. Chi is, psi is not. Or psi. That means that's psi. Psi. 
sine plus adjoint n. And, um, but on the other hand, from this we can see that psi minus on the left, in other words, we can say that this That's the relation that I wanted. And do you want me to drive this, or is this good enough? All right. OK, so this is, um, this is the nice way of doing uh, fermionic coherent states. Similarly, um, we were talking about, in the case of Bose field, let's get to the uh, simpler case of just a uh, We were talking about eigenstates of the Hermitian field operator. This is the conventional way of doing things. The trouble is, these things are like the, Q, the, the eigenstates of Q. These things are non-normalizable. And the same thing, these are non-normalizable, but in a continuously infinite way. Okay, so they're, they're very, they're, they're not only states of infinite energy, but they pack an awful lot of s s a singular nature into the path integral that maybe isn't needed. So what one can do instead is define uh, coherent states in, uh, in the following way. Then, uh, let me say it would, be, it would be like this. Oh, I've got my notes. Ready. I didn't bring these notes. So there's a matter of a sign. It would be pi of x. I want to use a notation. You see, we have phi of x being the field. And I want a notation for these guys, for this, that looks a little different. I can. I don't know, I'm almost tempted to use this notation. Okay, so we have functions q and p, and we have e to the i pi q minus phi p. Okay, now, once again, uh, what, to get this sign right, what we want to have is the following. D dagger Q, say, D. What will this look like? Well, the D dagger will be then D dagger, and it will, if we differentiate, so to speak, we're pulling down an I integral pi Q minus phi P. And we have the commutative, so in other words, the derivative of this, so it's the ddu of this, if there were a u there, then we would have, well, I don't want a q there, I want a phi of x. And this would be, say, dqy. Okay, so we have the commutation relations, this is all an equal time, say time zero. So phi of x, phi of y, is i delta x minus y. So we have here uh, a delta function, but instead of i, we have minus i. That gives altogether a 1, and so this gives um, uh, d dagger. The commutator will simply be then uh, q of y d. And so we have the rule that d dagger um, of q p phi of x d of q and p. And, and these should be square brackets since these are functionals we are. Uh, this would be then phi of x plus q of x. So I guess the right sign. 
So now when you go through the same razzmatazz and, and talk about D of Q and P on the vacuum, and this, can, this would be a, well, again, this is now the, the vacuum that's more or less physical. Oh, you, but, you integrated this, right? To get the 5x? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm skipping a lot of steps here. But um, a lot of you guys have seen a lot of quantum optics, so you know about this stuff. Oh, I've seen some. Huh? I've seen some. Would well, you want me to fill in the steps? No. I mean, it's just like that integration over there. Yes. But easier, since we don't have all the fermions and the mystical grasping variables and so forth. Okay, so these are just simply coherent states. But they're functional coherent states. And so you can do the pantheticle business in terms of these. Okay. Um, now, what did I want to say? Uh, oh, uh, notice that here, the positive frequency part of the field then annihilates this vacuum. So it's the positive frequency part of the field that on the state QP will give us Q positive frequency of X QP. And um, from the left, QP negative frequency part will give us QP uh, Q negative frequency at X. But in particular, this means then that QP, the field phi of x, QP, is just Q of x. So the field phi assumes in this state, QP, this particular value. So is pi plus the operator that has P as the eigenvalue? Pi, I'm sorry, say that again, pi plus? Positive frequency component of pi. Yes. That has p of x as its eigenvalue. Good. That would have yes. That would have p plus. Pi plus would have p plus and so forth. All right. Now and and basically um, you can think of uh, pi as phi dot and p as q dot basically. Okay. Now. Since we're talking about these things, there are, there are two quick applications of this, well, three. One is you could redo the whole Feynman diagram stuff in terms of coherent states, and then you have an intrinsically less singular formulation. Um, secondly, as you've heard in many, many physics colloquia, and in many courses, uh, people say that the Higgs field in the vacuum has some value, V0, which, what is it, 256 GeV, something like that? Anyway. Bigger than 100. It's big. Right. What, is, what does this actually mean? Well, of course, nothing in quantum field theory is, is simple, but to lowest order, what this means is that the physical vacuum is one of these states, one of these QP states. But since P is a time derivative, there's no need to have that there. And so it's in fact Q0. And in fact, to make it low energy, we take out not only the time dependence, but also the spatial dependence. So this Q is a constant, this constant being V0. So the Higgs vacuum is, so in other words, the Higgs, I guess I should use a The Higgs vacuum then is a state Q, zero, where Q is a constant. Um, and in fact, it would be V zero, whatever this is. And, um, 
these coherent states are normalized because this thing would be some D on the ordinary vacuum. Let me drop the plus sign. And uh, so this would be D of um, basically D0 zero and 0 on that. And uh, the normalization then would be, say, HB, HB would just be 0, D dagger D, 0. This is unitary, so this is just 0, 0, which is 1. So I lost how the, these QP coherent states are somehow less singular than the Five. They're normalized to unity. Oh, instead of being delta normalized? Yeah, and it's not just delta. It's a delta function. In other words, what's the normalization? Like, let, let, let's get real about this. Okay? It really is pretty crazy. In other words, let's sort of consider the ordinary phi eigenstate. Then it would be phi prime, phi double prime would be a product over all of space of delta of phi prime of x minus phi double prime of x. It's that bad. Okay. Now, let me take a drink of water. One can go in a couple of directions from this uh, point of view. One is um, the soliton direction. In other words, what you can what you can do is you can imagine that it might be interesting to look for. coherent states that minimize the energy. So you have some, let's, suppose we just have a scalar field theory. Well, QP is, is automatically normalized, so you just want to minimize that. Well, what you can show is that the state that minimizes that um, will be a solution of the field equation for the corresponding Lagrangian. In other words, if the Lagrange density for the field phi is, um, let's say, d mu phi like that, then you'd have the equation d mu partial of this with respect to d mu v is the partial of L with respect to v. And so if we have, say, a, an L which is of the form d, well, it would be d mu v, d mu v, and there'll be a half, and um, if we're in Peskin Schroeder land, then this is a plus actually. Um, and then there'll be minus a half m squared v squared, and then, well, let's not have it m squared v squared, let's have something more amusing. Let's have something like lambda squared minus uh, mu squared over the square root of lambda squared, something like that. All right, so if this is the Lagrangian, then you, you um, the Hamiltonian density, apart from the kinetic terms, is just this term here. And that would say that the, the coherent state that would minimize this would be the one where uh, it would be mu, actually it's mu squared over lambda, and it's two lambda. Or is it two, let's see. 
You see, if you multiply this out, what you get is minus lambda. No, I did. I was right. So that's right. The cross term is minus lambda with a two phi squared. Um, phi squared. Actually, it's a plus sign, isn't it? Phi squared mu squared over two lambda. And so this this should be. Let me put a one half here. Then we'll have an extra half, and this will cancel. That will cancel, and this will be a normal mass term, which would be phi squared mu squared. Um, so this would be a theory of particles of mass mu, scalar particles of mass mu, but it. It would, um, I'm puzzled as to why this is coming out with a, with a wrong sign. Yeah, that, all right. In any event, let's, let, let, let's skip over that. There's a subtlety there that I'm, that I need to skip over. In any event, this would be mu, phi would be mu over the square root of two lambda, and then no time dependence at all. So this would be the coherent state that would correspond to the minimum energy of this theory. And this would again be the Higgs field there. But on the other hand, one could look at more general solutions of this form. And in fact, there are some. Uh, and what these look like is, um, well, off the top of my head, I don't remember. But um, there are various, the, there are two possibilities for phi. It can be, if, if this is a single scalar field, then there are two possibilities. You can have a plus or minus here, because it's only phi squared that matters. So what you have then is that the vacuum is either the field always there or the field always here. Okay. And then what you can have as an excited first excited state of this this sort of soliton part of the theory is you can have a state that is in the vacuum all uh, all the way over here and then quickly changes up to the other vacuum. And then this thing can run along. Okay, because the difference in energy of here and there, there's no difference in energy. So it can just zoom along. It'll have kinetic energy if it's moving. And so this is this is a soliton solution. It's some hyperbolic tangent. Well, what are these two uh, horizontal lines again? Oh, what I'm plotting here is the field and I'm plotting space this way. Mm. And to tell you the truth, um, what, these are the positive and negative solutions? Uh, well, these are the positive and negative vacua. And actually, I think the exact solution only works in two dimensions of space time. In other words, one space, one time, when it's, well, actually, no, it, I think it does work in four. Anyway. In other words, this, this is phi equals zero. This is phi equal to mu over the root two lambda. And so if it's always in the negative state, then the energy is zero. If it's up here, the energy is zero. And those are the two possible vacua. And then you can switch from one to the other like that. So this is a soliton going this way. But you can also consider a case where you have the soliton like this. In other words, it's, it goes from the upper to the lower. And now you can imagine what happens if two of them collide. And bang, they disappear. Or actually, actually, I think the funny thing about solitons is you think that they would 
annihilate them and just give you a spray of ordinary particles. But instead, what tends to happen with many of, in many of these theories is that the solid ones just run right through each other. Okay. So let me let me switch now to get another um, application of uh, some of these ideas, namely that physical vacuum, time order products of various gauge invariant operators. Um, need to do the ratio because when you finish here, that's gone. But this is a ratio of path integrals of um, O1 up to ON. And now E to the minus Euclidean action integrate over all the fields divided by E to the minus Euclidean action integrate over all the fields. Okay? All right. Well, what you can what you can do is you can say uh, you can ask yourself: Are there some field configurations here that are particularly important? All right. Will there be the ones that would minimize this? Euclidean action density. And minimizing the action density means that the action should be stationary. And so you'd say zero is that, and, and, and this then is variation of Lagrangian, the Euclidean Lagrangian d4. Uh, in space. And what this gives you then, is, the thing that minimizes that is something that satisfies the field equations, but uh, in Euclidean space. And so in particular for, for different theories, there are sometimes solutions. And in particular for Yang Mills theories, you then have, well, there's the homework problem you were to derive the, 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 the uh, Yang-Mills field equation for the case of um, uh, just ordinary space-time. Uh, there's a closely related equation which you get for in, in Euclidean space. And the solutions of that then um, are that uh, the solutions of those equations are called instantons. Well, I shouldn't call them all instantons, but there are some solutions that have finite action. And so, so in other words, this, this, this action density, L sub e, is essentially zero everywhere, and then it has a sort of bump somewhere in space-time. And that's the center of the instanton. And um, the first of these was put forward by at Hoft um, back in um, back in the mid 70s at some point um, for the SU2 gauge theory, and then uh, other people, Witten in particular, derived a whole slew of other kinds of instantons. And so you're saying you can only get instantons if you have a Euclidean action from the Euclidean action. Yeah, the, 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 the nature of let's put it this way. Roughly speaking, solitons are solutions of the classical field equations in Minkowski space. Instantons are solutions of the classical field equations in Euclidean space. And so solitons, I mean, you know, who knows what is really true, but solitons you can think of as possibly being particles or being collective excitations of some sort. Instantons 
can be thought of as um, things that characterize the physical vacuum, because this is what you're, you mean, the mean value of time order products in the physical vacuum is given by this expression. Of course, this is Euclidean time ordering, so you've got e to minus h's in there. e to minus h's times the time order. So since these are localized and these are points in Euclidean space-time, right? So if they were points in Minkowski space-time... The, the space center time, of the instanton is a point okay. in, in, in Euclidean space-time, but the things are basically bumps. Okay. But if I had a point in Minkowski space-time, I could call that thing just an event. Yeah. So what, I mean, what's the interpretation of these things? I mean, why was it called instanton? No, what's, what's the interpretation? Of what? Instantons. Well, it's unclear. I mean, what happened was back in the 70s, people were um, just pointing out that if you tried to approximate this and looked at the, tried to look at the field equation, the fields that contribute most importantly, they'd be these instantons. And um, some people at Princeton were trying to do QCD this way. But they eventually, they eventually gave up because the papers got just more and more complicated. And um, I, that, I didn't know that stuff. People in field theory. <laughs> well, maybe it didn't. There was another thing that stopped them, though. Michael Kreutz started to approximate these uh, by using Wilson's technique of lattice gauge theory, and. Um, he then found that um, the he found then that on the lattice, the if you took here the time ordered product of um, i g integral well a mu of x a t a p x mu in a loop that this would go as e to the minus the area of loop. And again, this is after the thing has, after a certain, well, you see, on a, in, in the continuum, this thing would be actually zero. But on the lattice, certain singularities don't appear. And so you expect this as a confinement signal. And Kreutz showed that. And that meant that people who were pursuing this sort of died off. But it still is something that one can think about, namely that if you could somehow do these function ratios of functional integrals, this would be what would give the right answer. And in some sense, these uh, minimum action configurations play an important role because the configurations with infinite action are clearly not are clearly suppressed. Okay, well, I guess, so that was sort of the tour of a certain direction that we're going to go in, and there's, there's a lot more to say there, but I'm not going to try to say it today. Um, instead, I think next time I'm going to do um, some... Uh, some Feynman diagrams in, in Yangville State. Yeah, you're, you're entitled. <laughs> Anybody else want a, um, it's the Christmas season. Anybody want some candy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there any Christmas candy? Candy canes, perhaps? No, no. Okay. no. All I've got is this stuff. Anybody else? Uh, are there some peanut butter M&M's there? Peanut, or peanut. Okay, I'll take the peanut. They're good.